Let me ask you guys to stand as we read the scriptures together. From Matthew chapter 12. Then a demon oppressed man who was blind and mood was brought to him, and he healed him so he might have spoken saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man? then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but by this blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. Whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So we've been seeing how our Lord Jesus Christ, he is gentle and lowly. You know, towards the weak, towards the heavy burdened, he invites everyone who's battered and bruised by this world to come and enjoy life in his kingdom. Jesus came to strengthen the bruised reed, not to discard it. He came to fan into flame that smothering wick into a white-hot flame instead of just writing you off and casting you aside. This is how good and gracious our Lord is. This is how he treats the humble, the weak, the broken who come to him. Now, maybe it may be a little strange to us that Jesus doesn't meet our expectations of what a Messiah should be. In fact, he's not really here to meet any person's expectations. He's here to meet and do and perfectly fulfill God's expectations. All 300 different unique prophecies in the Old Testament about the person of the Messiah, the work of the Messiah, what he would do in his first coming, that's Jesus' goal. He's here to meet God's expectations, so there can be no mistaking who this Messiah is. Yet when we find that Jesus doesn't meet our expectations, we also see that he's often misunderstood. Sometimes Jesus is responded to with hostility and rejection. And that's the case that we see here today. The religious leaders of Israel, of the Jews, they accuse Jesus of being satanic. They blaspheme against the Son of Man. They blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. We've also seen that Jesus is following God's timetable. So, you know, he has been trying to, to pull, pull away, to put some distance between him and his opponents, but his opponents always find him. See, with Jesus, there is no real neutrality to Jesus. You, can either, you cannot sit on that fence. You will either love Jesus and worship him and serve him and have him as your Messiah, or you will hate him and reject him and deny him and denounce him. Today we're seeing how in this cleansing of this demon-possessed man that gives an opportunity, an occasion for the scribes and the Pharisees to, to call Jesus an agent of Satan. Yet we're going to see how Jesus and the way he responds, let that response challenge us to use some common sense to, to think about who Jesus is and commit to follow him. So we're not in any danger of committing this unpardonable sin. So I've given you guys an outline briefly for you guys to follow along to track our thoughts. The occasion, 23 and 20, uh, 22 and 23. The accusation, verse 24. Christ's response, 25 to 32, and that's broken down to three subpoints. The Pharisees' accusation is illogical. The real explanation for what Jesus is doing, and also a warning against the unpardonable sin. So let's look at this occasion in verse 22. There's this demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute. It's brought, he's brought to Jesus, and Jesus heals him so the man could speak and see. 
Now, unless Matthew told us that this man was possessed by a demon, we would never know that he was being oppressed by a demon. We could only see that this was a blind and a mute man. Matthew fills in his details for us that the, the cause for his muteness and blindness was from demon oppression. And we see here Jesus healed the man to perfect health. He could speak, he could see, he was fully restored. Yet the point of this healing is not the healing itself, but it's really the confrontation that follows. We know Jesus healed many, many people, hundreds of people, perhaps thousands of people from demonic oppression. And how did the people respond? How did the crowds respond? They saw it, they were amazed, they were in awe. And they were asking themselves, could this Jesus be? Could he be the son of David? Could he be the promised Messiah, the king, who would come and liberate Israel from her enemies? The one whom God had promised to sit upon David's throne, to usher in a messianic age of peace, of prosperity to the nation of Israel, you know, to restore all the land taken away by foreign enemies back to Israel so they would fully occupy that land. All the enemies kept at bay, paying tribute to the Messiah. I mean, this was in the mind of every single Jew, the mind of every single Israelite. That's their expectation of the Messiah. So the people here, they're kind of a little confused. They're a little bit skeptical. Because this Jesus, well, he's a good healer. He's gentle. He's humble. He's kind and all. But he doesn't quite fit our expectation of what a Messiah would be. He's not exactly the conquering king. So they're asking, is this really the Messiah? Is this really the son of David? Look how the Pharisees respond. You know, they're in the crowds, they hear of it, and they respond and say, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. No, they were certainly not ready to receive Jesus as the son of David, as their Messiah. In their minds, he's just another rogue teacher, another rogue healer. And they're calling him, you know, you're doing this by the power of Beelzebul. That's really a name that Jews gave to Satan. They're calling him the Lord of the flies, the Lord of the manure pile to, to make fun and mock Satan. But unlike many liberal skeptics, perhaps of today, many liberal churches, you know, the, and denominations, you know, they will all affirm Jesus was a good man, he was a good moral teacher, but they will deny that Jesus had any kind of supernatural powers. They will find some kind of way to explain away all of Jesus' miracles as some sort of magical illusion, some smoke and mirrors, some sleight of hand, some sort of David Copperfield kind of trick or something. Now, I've heard it, maybe you've heard it as well. You know, some people would say, oh, when Jesus was feeding the 5,000, well, Jesus didn't actually create bread and, and fish. Well, he had fish stored up and you know, hidden away in a cave. And, and as he would got to the cave, he would bring out the food, and, and they would think, oh, that Jesus was creating food. Now, if you've ever heard anyone say that, for no, congratulations, you've heard someone to teach you or, or a pastor who does not believe the Bible, who does not believe the supernatural works of God. You've heard a liberal teacher. No, but the Pharisees here, you know, they are affirming that Jesus heals. They know he can heal. They know he can do miracles. They know he has power over demons. They just won't admit that he's doing so by the power of God. So that's what they're doing. Their only conclusion is that we can't deny the miracles. There's so many. They're, so, they're all over the place. Everyone can see them. So we're just going to attack the source of the miracles, attack Christ's power itself. We're going to conclude that it's by sorcery that Jesus is doing this. It's, it's by black magic. It's by Satanism or Beelzebub. It's demonic. Their conclusion is that Jesus is a demonic sorcerer. Fairly convenient for them because, you know, sorcery was punishable by death according to the Old Testament. So instead of, you know, Jesus being the Messiah, instead of committing themselves, surrendering to follow Jesus, to worship him, to, to align with him, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, accuse Jesus of being demonic. And they know that's not true. They know it's a lie, and yet, you know, they're still believing it. And how is Jesus responding here? Well, look at his response. He first you know, accuses them or, and says, your, your, your reasoning is illogical. Now, notice here that Jesus knows what they were thinking. 
You know, the Pharisees and the crowds, they were off somewhere in this massive crowd. You know, they're far away from what Jesus could hear with his ears. But Jesus was able to read their minds. He knew their thoughts. So don't mistake or miss the subtle miracle here where Jesus is omniscient. He knows what's going on in the hearts and, and in the minds of the, the scribes and the Pharisees. And he responds here with logic, with common sense, saying every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste. No city or no house divided will stand. Now, everyone gets this. A kingdom divided, you know, a kingdom which has civil war will no longer be a kingdom for very long. Even with the greatest kingdom at that time, the imperial power of Rome, the one thing that could tear them down was internal division and civil war. And we know definitely historically that did contribute to Rome's fall. And we also know a house, a city divided cannot stand. I mean, for example, if you have a, in a home, you have a husband and wife who are always, you know, at each other's neck fighting and quarreling and, and abusing one another, you know, unless God intervenes in that situation and causes some regeneration, something to happen in them to be changed and saved, we know what the natural outcome of that relationship is going to be. At some point, they're going to file for divorce and they're going to be separated. It's going to be divided. It's a house divided. So there's that cliche, which is often based on truth. United we stand, divided we fall. This is common. This is a truism everywhere. So if Satan is going to cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And Jesus is asking you know, the scribes, you know, why would Satan want a civil war amongst his demonic ranks? How can his kingdom stand and survive when there's so much great internal division? I mean, even though you know, Satan's kingdom is an evil, wicked kingdom, they still need to be united enough to accomplish their wicked purposes, right? If it's divided, it will fail and fall. Jesus is basically saying to the scribes and Pharisees, now, please explain to me, how does Satan benefit from me casting out all these demons, these hundreds, these thousands of demons? How does Satan benefit? Explain it to me. In other words, your argument your suggestion is ridiculous. It's illogical. It goes against common sense. It goes against everyday experience. We know when you're united, you're standing, but you're divided, we hope fall. Now, after breaking out and, and revealing that this argument is illogical, Jesus gets a little bit more personal. He says, you know, if I cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Now, the Pharisees, the Jews, they had exorcists. They had people who would, you know, cast out demons as well. There's a well-known example in Acts chapter 19. You know, the Jewish exorcists who were casting out demons, and, you know, they found out, hey, if we use the name of Jesus or we invoke the name of Paul, that seems to be more effective in casting out the demons. So they go cast out demons in the name of Jesus in the name of, of Paul, even though they don't believe in Jesus. But what's interesting in that story there is, you know, the demons, they, they spoke through the people they were possessing and said, yo, yes, this Jesus we know. This Paul we also know, but who in the world are you? So they beat those exorcists and, you know, almost beat, beat them to death. So all the crowds here, you know, they affirm Jesus has power over demons. It was vastly superior to all the other Jewish exorcists. So Jesus here, he's playing along. Let's assume for a moment that I am casting out demons by the power of Satan. If that's what I'm doing, but what about your exorcists? What are they doing? You know, by what power are they casting out demons? If you're going to accuse me of being a buzzable, then your logic also determines that they are also casting out demons by the power of demons. Of course, the exorcists themselves, they would you know, deny that. They would say, we're doing it by the power of God. They would venomously deny they were casting out demons by the power of Satan. I mean, how could anyone who's casting out demons be in league with Satan? Therefore, they will be your judges. And if you're slandering Jesus and, you know, for doing the same thing as your exorcists, then those exorcists will rise up and judge you for calling the exorcism that they're doing demonic rather than by the power of God. No, either way, then this is a very embarrassing situation for the Pharisees. Their arguments are illogical, they're inconsistent, and Jesus is pointing out to them all the hypocrisy of what they're doing. It's being exposed to all the crowds, to all the people. Let's look at how Jesus responds. What is his real explanation for his miracles? 
Jesus says, if it is by the power of the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. He's saying, my power has comes from God, the Holy Spirit. If this is true, then the kingdom of God is here. The king is here. The king who's defeating Satan, driving away his demons by the power of the Holy Spirit, is here. And he's coming to set up a kingdom for you. This is really the meaning behind all Jesus' power over all these demons. It shows the people how powerful the kingdom of God is. He is pushing back the power of Satan, pushing back the evil forces to establish a kingdom of holiness and righteousness. In verse 29, Jesus uses this illustration to show his power over demons. Now, how can you enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless first he binds the strong man? Then afterward, you can plunder his house. I mean, it's kind of foolish, right? If someone were to knock on your door and say, hey, I'm going to come into your house, steal your nice flat screen TV, your jewelry, your electronics, anything else I see valuable, now stand aside and let me go in and take all your stuff. That would be foolish for him to try to do that. Now, if they're going to try to rob you, they're going to you know, stick a gun in your face. They're going to bind you. They're going to make sure that you can't defend yourself or your stuff or call the police. Right? That's what they're going to do. Jesus is saying, likewise, it's foolish that Jesus is trying to liberate all these captives without first binding the strong man who is Satan. In fact, Jesus has already entered the strong man's house. Satan's the ruler of this world. He's strong. And Jesus is not kind of sneaking around, going around some back, you know, you know some hidden door, some hidden entrance. He's, he's entering the front door. He has this direct confrontation with Satan, an overpowered Satan. And when did that happen? Right after Christ's baptism. Right? Satan took Jesus along. He was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, right? And Jesus defeated Satan by the power of the Holy Spirit, by using the word of God and explaining it rightly. And Satan could not do anything. He could not prevent Jesus from teaching the gospel, could not prevent all his demonic forces to being exposed and revealed. And now Jesus, he's plundering Satan's house. He, he's setting and releasing and rescuing people from the captive to Satan and freeing them, transferring many of them into the kingdom of God. Exposing darkness, healing the disease that demons caused. And he's showing he has unrivaled authority over sin, over sickness, over disease, even death itself. And the question we need to ask then, who has so much power over Satan? Who can be so much powerful over the forces of darkness? The only answer we can come arrive at is only God can be. Now, Christians, sometimes we struggle with trying to understand Satan and demons. Now, for some, Satan is so big that he's behind every sickness, every illness. You know, he's behind every bush, every inconvenience. It's Satan. And so you've got to bind Satan and cast out Satan. But we need to remember that Satan is not God. You know, if, God, if Satan is so big, he's behind everything, then people have elevated Satan to this kind of God level where Satan is omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent, he's everywhere all the time. We need to understand Satan, even though he's wiser, he's smarter, he's stronger than any of us, he's still a created being. He's still subservient to God. And greater is he who is within you, the Holy Spirit, than he who is in the world. Now, on the other extreme, you have people who think Satan is so small that he is irrelevant. Or Christians living like, you know, that devil in that, that red suit with the, the corns and the pitchfork, that guy can't do anything to me. You know, if you're convinced that Satan is so small or he doesn't exist or he's irrelevant, of course, you're not going to guard yourself. You're not going to prepare yourself against an attack that you don't believe is going to ever happen. You know, Peter reminds us, you know, don't, don't, don't take Satan so lightly. That Satan is like a, a, a roaring lion, you know, prowling around, seeking to devour somebody. So be on guard, resist him. You now Paul tells us, put on the full armor of God that you may stand against the devil's schemes. So Jesus goes in verse 30. 
makes this next statement saying, whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever is not gathered with me will scatter. And here Jesus is showing that there are really only two sides to this whole cosmic world. There is Jesus' side and there is Satan's side. You either are on Jesus' side, you receive him as the Messiah, you receive him as the Christ, or you do not. If you're on his side, you will support him, you will follow him, you will gather and and live for him regardless of what the cost might be. If you're on Satan's side, then you will oppose the work of Christ. You will scatter when you're being exposed. And the Pharisees here, they're showing themselves to be what's on Satan's side. They're accusing Jesus and blaspheming Jesus. See, there's no neutrality here in this world. Jesus doesn't give you that option. And that maybe seems strange to us because, you know, when we hear, when we talk to unbelievers, we never hear them say, I'm against Jesus. No one is that forefront. Most people will probably say something, well, I don't believe in Jesus, or he's good for you, but he's not good for me. I don't really need him right now. Thinking that, oh, Jesus is optional, that you can take him or leave him and and just kind of get on with life with or without Jesus. But Jesus says, look, there's only two ways. You're either with me or you're against me. If you think you're neutral towards me, well, that in reality means that you're against me. Because if you're either living for yourself, if Jesus Christ is not Lord, if he's not king of your life, then you're living for yourself. You're the Lord. You're the one whom you love. You're the one whom you do everything for. And you need to think about, you know, where does that self-love, self-worship, self-exaltation derive from? Who was the first being to say, I'm not going to worship Jesus. I'm not going to worship God. I'm going to worship myself first. And that's really Satan. That's Lucifer. You know, self-worship, self-glorifying, self-exaltation. Worship myself rather than God. That's at the heart of Satanism. You know, it's not those people, you know, wearing those hoods, you know, doing like, you know, weird stuff on Halloween. That's not real Satanism. That's like Hollywood Satanism, okay? Real Satanism is self-worship. It's self-love. I'm going to serve myself rather than serve God. So you got to decide for yourself. Is Jesus good or is he evil? Is he good, then follow him. If he's evil, then reject him. There are only two ways. Pick a side. Don't be on that fence. And lastly, Jesus here, he warns us against this unpardonable sin. He goes on the offense, it says to the Pharisees, Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven with people. But the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. This is kind of a scary, shocking passage. Because we've been told and we read through the scriptures that God the Father, he is so merciful, he is so compassionate, he he is gracious and forgiving all of our sins. Yet when we get here, we see that there is a limit to the mercy of God. The limit is this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And what is blasphemy? Blasphemy is speaking something slanderous or cursing or accusatory against God that is not true. Anyone can commit blasphemy by just saying something against God. It's kind of similar to, you know, taking the Lord's name in vain. If you use your words to curse God, if you use your words to spread and slander God and saying something's not true about him. Yet Jesus also says every sin... Every blasphemy against the people commit will be forgiven. And this forgiveness is not automatic. It depends upon one thing. Will you repent of that sin? Will you confess that sin and turn away from it? If you don't repent, there is no forgiveness. And all sin that's unrepented of does have eternal consequences. But if you repent, if you will turn away and change your mind about them and turn back to following the Lord, you will be forgiven. Additionally, Jesus says, blasphemy against the Son of Man, against Jesus himself, is forgivable as well. Granted, there is real repentance. I guess in some sense you can think about it, you know, when Peter denied Jesus Christ three times, I guess you could say that was blasphemy as well. He renounced and denied his Lord. That was forgivable. We have Saul of Tarsus, right? 
a blasphemer by his own confession, persecutor of Christ and the church. He did so out of ignorance to God. He did so out of ignorance of the Holy Spirit. But God saved him. Christ saved him, appeared to him on that road to Damascus, forgave him of his sin. You know, perhaps the worst sin imaginable that you could commit against the Son of Man, against Christ, would be to put him to death. But you remember, even as Jesus was hanging there on that cross, what did he pray and ask God for? You know, Father, forgive them of their sin. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus prayed for the Roman soldiers, those centurions, those people who were just crucifying another convicted criminal. They didn't know who he was. And there's even some, you know, not biblical evidence, but there's some extra biblical evidence that, you know, this Roman centurion who was overseeing the crucifixion, the one who, you know, put the spear in Jesus' side, there's some evidence there that he came to faith in Christ. There's a legend about it. I don't know how true it is, but you can look it up. So there is a kind of blasphemy that is forgivable, a kind of blasphemy that is not. What's not forgivable? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit either in this age or in the age to come, verse 32. So what is that? What is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Well, here, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is when you've got this full knowledge about the person of Jesus Christ. You've witnessed his miracles. You've witnessed his teaching. You've seen him do things that no other person can do, and yet you respond like the Pharisees. You denounce the Holy Spirit. You say, that is not the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of Satan. That's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So in order to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, you must have this willful, persistent, permanent denial of the Holy Spirit's work. You must call the Holy Spirit's work satanic and demonic after witnessing the miracles of Christ. So I don't think you can commit this exact sin today. I mean, no one has seen Christ do miracles. No one can go back in, in time and see him do some miracle and say, oh, that, that, that's not from the Holy Spirit. That's from Satan. So you can't really commit this sin today. And sometimes people are scared that, oh, I've committed this sin, the unpardonable sin. No, I've blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. Well, from what this passage teaches, if that's what your thinking is, you probably haven't committed that yet because you're still sensitive to the spirits. You not, have not written off the fact that you, you're sinning and, and you want to be right with God. You have haven't come to the place where you're so rejecting him and that you don't even care that God exists. So real Christians can't commit this sin. The Holy Spirit in you will in time, when you sin of any sin, will convict you that you have sinned and draw you to repentance and draw you to grace and draw you to sanctification. So while you can't commit this exact sin today, People can reject and resist the Holy Spirit's work. And many people do. And if you resist and reject the Holy Spirit's work, you know, and you die in that unbelief, you die in that unrepentance, well, you will spend eternity in hell. I don't think that's the exact same sin as, as blasphemy here, but it's the similar result. You end up in hell for rejecting and resisting the Holy Spirit's work. Because after all, what is the role of the Holy Spirit? I mean, John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit exists. To, this helper God will send. He will teach you and guide you in all the truths concerning Jesus Christ. John 15, 26, the Holy Spirit, the helper, will, will testify of Christ, will point you to Christ. John 16, 8, the Holy Spirit's role in this world is to convict us of sin, convict us of righteousness and judgment. Convict us, firstly, that you have sinned against God. Secondly, that there is a righteous standard that God has for all people, and you don't meet it. And thirdly, that you will be judged and condemned and deserving of God's judgment because of that. This is the Holy Spirit's job, to reveal the truth about your own sinful nature, to draw you and point you to Christ as a solution for your sin and judgment. So, you know, today, if you study the scriptures, you've come to this conclusion that the Holy Spirit is not of God. He is not God. He is demonic. Well, if, if you do that, you'll never find forgiveness for your sin. You're rejecting the Holy Spirit, the only one who can save you. If you shut off the only way to salvation, of course you won't be saved. 
Now, you can't just do this out of ignorance because, you know, if you're ignorant, you can always learn and, and confess and repent of that. And even if you sin against the Holy Spirit out of ignorance, you can re repent and be saved. Yeah, but if you're kind of blaspheming like, like, like the Pharisees, you have this full knowledge of it, you understand all the truth about Christ, you know his teaching, you see his miracles, you know what he has claimed about himself, and you say, no, this Jesus, he is demonic. He is doing this all by the power of Satan. That's your final conclusion. You go to your death that way. You cannot be saved. You cannot be saved if you conclude that Jesus is an agent of Satan. So if you reject the Holy Spirit's teaching about the truth and the person of Jesus Christ, his work, you resist the conviction of sin, you remain unrepentant. And the wrath of God will remain upon you. If you die unrepentant, if you die unbelieving, you will face the eternal consequence of your choice. So we've seen here that people can have very hard hearts. There are some like the Pharisees who can be eyewitnesses of all these miracles of Jesus. His power, his healings, his ability to teach and read their minds and outsmart any of their arguments. In any of their traps, you can see and receive all that revelation. And people will still choose to believe a lie rather than admit the truth. They would rather call Jesus an agent of Satan than have those eyes of faith to believe that this person is the only one who could be the Son of God, the Messiah, the, the Savior, the Lord. We've also seen that Jesus here, even when he is blasphemed, he is so patient, he is so merciful. To his enemies. He has the patience to show the Pharisees the error of their arguments with such brilliant logic, with such memorable illustrations. And Jesus even gets down to the very heart of the matter. Are you for me or are you against me? There are only two sides. Will you humble yourself to receive me as the Lord, as the Messiah? Or you will continue to stand against me on this devil's side. It's even in our Lord here, you know, rebuking the Pharisees about, you know, you're blaspheming me. You're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's still an act of mercy. He's warning these, his enemies about this dangerous line that you are about to cross. If you cross that line, there will be no forgiveness for you for all eternity. Yet the good news of the gospel is... If you forsake your sin, if you turn away from your sin, you turn away from living for yourself like you are Lord, you are King, you will find forgiveness when you come to Christ. There is no sin that you can commit that will not be forgiven if you repent of it, if you turn away from it and trust that Jesus died for it. He says mercy and his grace is so much greater than our sin. So don't persist in unbelief. Do not remain in rebellion to Jesus Christ being the rightful ruler and Lord of your life. Surrender to him. Submit to him. Serve him. And taste and see how great and merciful and kind our Lord is. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your words. We're thankful for how Christ exposes the deepest hypocrisy in our hearts. Lord, we are thankful that you reveal the truth about sin and judgment and, and righteousness to us. We pray that the Holy Spirit's work will continue in our hearts, continue revealing to us sins that we must confess and turn from so we can be more pleasing and holy to you. Lord, we pray that Christ will be exalted and magnified we pray for anyone who is struggling with sin, struggling with unbelief, that you would show them the truth about yourself. And in your, by your Spirit's work, you would draw them to grace, draw them to see the glory and the, the mercy and grace of Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.